Today on Missing Link. Where's the connection between the Stone Age and plastics? What do man-made materials have to do with explosives? What brings nitroglycerin to the medical arena? And are the worlds of medicine and Napoleon III connected? There aren't any links? Oh yes there are, you just have to look really hard. Missing Link. People foraged as hunter-gatherers in the extensive forests of Central Europe for hundreds of thousands of years. They tracked wild animals. Those who had an excellent understanding of nature, who were the fastest and most accurate, were the most successful. But then came a groundbreaking innovation. More and more hunter-gatherers abandoned their itinerant lifestyle. Ever more people established permanent settlements. The reasons for this are unclear. Had the population grown? Had there been a change in climate? Had the Stone Age forests been overhunted? The Neolithic Revolution. Farmers and cattle breeders from the Near East introduced a new lifestyle. For the first time, people in Central Europe began building houses and producing their own food. Along the Elbe and Sala rivers, on the banks of the Danube and the Isar, from the Black Sea to the Paris Basin, agriculture and settlement spread unabated throughout Central Europe. Walls of wattle and mud. Tree bark, straw and reeds for the roofs. Nature provided all the building materials Stone Age settlers needed. The success of the village community was dependent on individual skill and the concerted efforts of the people who lived within these carefully constructed roofs and walls. The settlers hammered sharp tools from flintstone in the shadows of these longhouses. Women used linen to fashion Stone Age clothing. Grains were the staple of their diets, and processing them quickly became ensconced cultural tradition. They all had to rely on one another. Perhaps it was the desire for order and central organization that led to the building of these elaborate monuments. Perhaps they were an expression of community. Symbols of prosperity and power to outsiders. For insiders, peaceful sanctuaries that provided a sense of home. Prestigious monuments visible from afar, nearly 7,000 years old. Protected by palisades, ditches meters deep, and accessible only via earthen bridges and entrances aligned with the course of the sun. The development of an agricultural society was a constant work in progress, full of triumphs and failures. And within the short time frame of 300 years, agricultural progress led to the construction of these large circular structures. This began sometime between 4,800 and 4,500 BC. Centuries of hard work. It was the same for the descendants of the farmers who came as colonists from the Near East as it was for indigenous people who established settlements. Despite all the crises and famines, these people did not abandon this new way of living and as such made a key contribution to the successful cultural evolution of the human race. An economic system based on production had prevailed. Whether film, furniture or cups, multi-purpose synthetic materials are found in every modern household. We live in a plastic world. 
But what connection exists between the Stone Age and synthetic materials? The Stone Age has been over for a while now, and since that time people have learned a thing or two. The world of today is packed with materials that Stone Age people had never even dreamt of. Apart from all the metals, there are the plastics. And about these plastics, we have pretty mixed feelings. They're a bit like a swat or a bookworm in school. It seems they can do just about anything and have an answer for everything. But nobody seems to like them. The development of plastic, though, didn't happen by Stone Age man sitting around in caves longing for the blessings of modernity. They did their own research into plastics. Using the bark of birch trees, they distilled birch pitch, mankind's very first plastic. This was mostly used as a glue and was really sticky. Its remains have been found in stone tools that are over 200,000 years old. Impressive, but the feeling of ambivalence remains. Just how long will it be before our legacy of plastic fully rots away? Nothing brightened up drab post-war Europe like plastic. During the post-war economic boom, it was deemed one of the greatest human achievements ever. Old forms remain, but with colourful new makeovers. A wide array of plastics have been developed since the start of the 20th century. Their unlimited range of shapes and seemingly eternal lifespans have manufacturers and consumers counting their blessings. Synthetic fibres and plastic objects become symbols of progress. The industry booms. Inquisitive chemists devise new chemical compounds, creating long chains of elements or polymers, and continually discover new undreamt-of uses for synthetic materials. Even now, scientists in the think tanks of large chemical companies continue to search for materials with unique new properties. What will the next big synthetic material be? The light bulb as we know it may soon be obsolete thanks to a new light-emitting plastic film that can be fashioned into lamps or used as wallpaper. The light source, electroluminescent crystals sandwiched between plastic film. The system is made much like a sandwich. It's basically like a hamburger. The lighting element is in the middle and the ketchup and mustard layers perform specific functions. If you apply electric current, then the bread lights up. The light is still somewhat weak. It may merely seem like trendy 1970s decor, but it could soon become part and parcel of our everyday lives. Yet another idea, focused light. Just apply a bit of pressure with your fingers and these forceps light up the working area. An ingenious idea for application in medical instruments. And here's one for the home. Here we've got a transparent panel, and if I switch it off, it becomes opaque. When I turn it on, it becomes much like the surface of an LCD monitor. The electric current goes through it and it turns it transparent. That's what makes it possible for us to see through it. Whether a visionary lighting element or a TV screen, plastic is the material of the future but only for as long as there are enough raw materials. The plan, to make plastic out of organic materials. Crop and food waste is being used to manufacture organic plastics. However, because this is a relatively new sector with very limited experience compared to the conventional crude oil-based plastic industry, it requires a good dose of pioneering spirit. Depending on what it's made for, it takes us six months to a year to introduce a cup to the market. A cup can have a lot of different uses and must be durable enough to withstand them all. For example, a cup for a vending machine must be able to withstand a certain fall velocity. So we have to run lots of tests and ensure that it can fulfill a range of functions before introducing it to the market. When all is said and done, the organic cup is not only as good as its predecessor, it's better. This plastic gives off a popcorn-like smell when it's being produced, so it even smells natural. And it has the advantage that it doesn't break or tear as easily when you crumple it up. To 
To survive in a global economy, pioneering spirit is required at chemical giants like Bayer too. Developer Eckhart Faltin looks into the future. Plastics are becoming more intelligent, more functional, and what we're doing with plastics today is turning them into an interface between man and machine. Plastics can already imitate human skin and not just smooth young skin. But materials that feel and look deceptively real are only the beginning. From prostheses to robots, in the future, machines will be able to process human stimuli and sensations. We're moving more and more into the realm of biology, towards substances that people can interact with and that respond to us. They can tell us if something is soft or hard. We can say we even want our plastics to get goosebumps. We want them to send feedback to the user. If developers realize their visions, we will be living in a world with more and not less plastic in the future. Controlled underground explosions. Lots of explosives are required to build the Gotthard Tunnel. But what do these explosions have to do with plastic? Tunnel constructors have a tough job, which is why to shift mountains they reach for explosives. In earlier times it used to be a very dangerous job because then they used nitroglycerine, an explosive that went off just by shaking it. Help was at hand when in the lab of Alfred Nobel a bottle of nitroglycerine accidentally spilt into a container of diametaceous earth or kieselgur. Instead of the accident causing an explosion, it caused the discovery of dynamite and no explosion. A similar thing happened to the chemist Roy Plunkett. Whilst looking for a refrigerant for fridges, he discovered Teflon or PTFE. In the world of chemistry, chance and coincidence has a long tradition. Teflon was discovered in 1938, and so the story of it being a byproduct of the space program is just an urban myth. What's no myth, though, is that Alfred Nobel founded and funded the Nobel Prize. Each year, the interest paid on his wealth is awarded to the winners of the Nobel Prize, totaling around 5 million euro. Nobel's poor descendants, though, might not have thought it a dynamite idea. Shift change in Sederun, Switzerland one of the five building sites of Alp Transit Gotthard Limited. This lift takes the men down into the mountain at a rate of 12 meters a second, down to the tunnel floor. They are digging the Gotthard Railway Tunnel. 2,000 specialists work around the clock to finish this important modern railway link. Tunnel builders are always susceptible to unpredictable areas of rock. The most challenging section of the Gotthard Tunnel is in the Swiss Alps, under the village of Sedrun. The shaft leading down to the building site is 800 meters deep. They're down here, preparing one of the countless blasts. Everyone must vacate the area around the tunnel's work face. The rock is too soft to use tunnel drilling machinery, which would inevitably get stuck. Every six hours, they repeat the same procedure. 400 kilograms of explosives are connected to an electric detonator. The tunnel builders must keep a safety clearance of 300 meters. Then a 10,000 volt electric pulse is sent to ignite the explosives. Each blast blows away up to five meters of rock. The rock that will be transported away during the entire building phase 
would be enough to make five piles the size of the Pyramid of Cheops. A geologist is one of the first to enter after the explosion. He must examine the rock to see if it's still stable. If the rock on the work face gets too brittle, the outcome of the blasts becomes impossible to predict. This time, the geologist is very concerned. After examining the rock, he realizes it's even softer than expected. Even so, they can keep blasting in the Gotthard Tunnel. Gigantic drills cut their way through the rock. The boreholes are drilled using a computerized drill that follows a precisely calculated blast plan for the specific type of rock. The blasts always start at the center and move outwards. Engineers have calculated that this blasting method is five times more effective than detonating all the charges at once. They ceased using gunpowder long ago. In the Gotthard Tunnel, they're using state-of-the-art binary explosives in the boreholes. Now all the blasting charges must be connected to extremely precise delay elements. A single signal is then sent to each cap detonator. The explosive charges must detonate one by one with a delay of mere milliseconds. This releases a powerful and destructive wave that moves out from the center, producing the most effective blast possible. A frenzied emergency medical tent in an earthquake region. There are numerous casualties, yet medicine and medical equipment are scarce. But what does medicine have to do with explosives? Long before Alfred Nobel managed to turn nitroglycerine into dynamite, this dangerous fluid that through even a little shaking could explode served another completely different purpose. Nitroglycerine was prescribed as a medicine for heart conditions. Nitro works by expanding the blood vessels and is still in widespread use today in the treatment of angina. And Alfred Nobel himself took nitroglycerine for his heart condition. Whether after he discovered his trick he still used nitro or turned to sucking on a stick of dynamite, history doesn't record. The 12th of May 2008, the earth shakes in Diu Jiangyan. It's a catastrophe that results in 80,000 deaths and nearly 40,000 injured. Medicine is badly needed. All the hospitals in the region hit by the quake have been destroyed. China asks for international assistance. The German Red Cross sends an entire hospital in individual pieces packed into hundreds of boxes that include tents, x-ray machines and other devices, even an inflatable operating theater. Aid workers have brought a total of 80,000 tons of freight with them from Berlin. Everyone lends a hand and the clinic is ready to operate in only 52 hours. Disaster workers assist Dr. Moch in erecting the last tent on a motorway, which is the best available site in the midst of all the rubble. He's here to instruct his Chinese colleagues. They have excellent medical training, but none of them are familiar with the equipment. The mobile technology is elementary, but robust. It's a question of priorities. The first question we ask is, what are the most dangerous and common illnesses and what groups of people are the most at risk? And from there, we set up a simple hospital with good technology. That is quality, yet scaled down technology. Dr. Cheng rushes to an emergency. Although the world at large has already forgotten the earthquake, many people continue to risk their lives to rescue their belongings from the rubble. This man was buried when he ventured into his home. The misfortunes continue after the great disaster. Two days ago, 
The day before yesterday, we had 600 patients, and yesterday it was over 900. Dr. Moch from the German Red Cross holds what amount to lectures to show the Chinese doctors how to use the machinery. He wants them to know what this mobile hospital unit has to offer. It isn't as though we're trying to train our Chinese colleagues to be doctors. What we're doing is trying to explain to them how to use this hospital facility so they can use it themselves in other disasters. This is why Thomas Mock's main objective is to make them feel confident enough to handle even seriously injured patients, despite the primitive conditions. After all, they provide the only hope of medical assistance for the 200,000 people in this district of Du Jiangyang. However, when the paramedics bring a severely injured woman in, the doctor decides not to accept her. He still feels performing an operation here is too risky. This patient must be sent to a real hospital. It's too dangerous here to deal with this patient. But the nearest intact hospital is 100 kilometers away. And it's doubtful that she'll be treated there after traveling for hours. A Tibetan man has trudged to the mobile hospital from his mountain village. It took him days to get here, and the doctors suspect he did it with a broken pelvic bone. Even with the help of the new X-ray machine, they are unable to make a definite diagnosis. They want to consult an expert in the provincial capital of Chengdu. Chinese technicians have hooked a webcam and the X-ray device up to the internet. The diagnosis from afar is quick and relieving. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. So, no problem. Extracting some of the blood and fluid from the wound will suffice to make the bruising go down. He should be feeling better soon. Many others are not so lucky. Dr. Cheng treats patients in his mobile medical unit until late in the night. In the meantime, it's become his hospital. <laughs> and although it may have its shortcomings, they're far outweighed by the possibilities it provides. Thomas Moch visits the children's ward for the last time. He must return to Germany. The mobile hospital will stay here until the old hospital can be rebuilt. In 1870, Napoleon III led France into the Franco-Prussian War. It would end in a devastating defeat for France. But what does Napoleon III have to do with medical care? Napoleon III was not only the Emperor of France, he was, above all, master of the bloody battlefield. And one of his bloodiest was the Battle of Solferino in 1859 during the Second Italian War of Independence. It was the Austrians versus the French and Sardinians fighting for freedom. By chance, a Swiss businessman, Henri Dunant, happened to be close to the battlefield, where thousands of wounded soldiers lay at death's door. His shocking accounts of the catastrophic care for the wounded soldiers caused five years later the establishing of the International Red Cross. Initially an organization to help injured soldiers, the Red Cross later went on to help civilians too. That ambulances bearing a Red Cross are today seen on city streets has its roots in the barbaric massacre at Solferino where Napoleon III prevailed. After several failed attempts to grasp power and a bloody coup d'etat, Louis Napoleon was finally crowned Emperor of France. He proved a progressive ruler. As Emperor Napoleon III, he liberalized the system of government modernized France's economic system and infrastructure, and hosted spectacular world expositions. He later married the Spaniard Eugenie de Montillo, a conservative Catholic who wanted one thing more than anything else, war with Prussia. A wish shared by France's elite, who wished to halt Prussia's ascent. At the time, Napoleon suffered from an acute bladder ailment and was far too weak to stop the war against the country he once called home. Bismarck goads France into declaring war on Prussia. 
1870 would mark the end of Napoleon's rule and the beginning of the ascent of Prussia. The ambitious Prussian army stormed to victory after victory in France. The fate of the French forces was sealed at the Battle of Sedan. The Germans soon advanced to Paris and forced the French army to capitulate. In a few short years, King Wilhelm of Prussia had vanquished half of Europe, a victor through and through. Now Emperor Napoleon III must hand over his sword too, and with it, vast areas of his state. For France, it signified the bitter end of a great era that's splendidly symbolized by the Palace of Versailles. This is where the Sun King, Louis XIV, reveled in his triumphs and power. Now the grandiose Hall of Mirrors has become a showroom for the decorations and medals of German princes. And it's no coincidence that Germany's dignitaries should meet here to officially re-establish the German Empire. For it was France who had once destroyed it. Versailles meant revenge for the humiliation they had suffered. The French took offence at the Germans' jubilant display, which this man made possible. Otto von Bismarck, the architect of the new empire. He pulls the strings, though not without resistance from his countrymen. Many here are mistrustful of him. The princes are afraid of losing their sovereignty. The new emperor himself is less than ecstatic. He had long resisted subordinating his powerful Prussian state to a new state with an uncertain future. Would he be nothing more than a puppet monarch in this new empire? The grand staging of the event hides the skepticism. But at the moment of his greatest triumph, Bismarck is more isolated than ever before. Even though it was his genius that had completely redrawn the map of Europe and defeated Napoleon III. Otto von Bismarck controls the fate of Prussia and the German Empire for more than three decades, with cunning and backroom diplomacy. He views political opposition as nothing more than a nuisance. He sees no need for more wars or military conflicts. He doesn't want the world to fear Germany, but to trade with it. He feels the empire should be content with its territorial spoils. But everything would change in 1888. Wilhelm II ascends to power, and Bismarck is pushed into obscurity, just like his former adversary, Napoleon III. 